When they discover a dinosaur bone, it doesn't come up with a label, which is, I'm 100 million years old. What the museums tell us is a lot of speculation. You've heard the story about how dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, but there's a lot of evidence that people, dinosaurs, lived at the same time. I'm gonna tell you a secret, a paleontological secret. Dinosaur bones don't have to be millions of years old. We're going to chat with someone now who says they actually can't be. I'm here with Dr. Taz Walker from Creation Ministries International. Taz, you teach about dinosaurs all around the country. And um, in particular, you do refer to one dinosaur when you're teaching. What is that dinosaur and what, what do you say about it? Well, it's a dinosaur that was found in a little t near a little town in Queensland called Mutterborough. So they found the dinosaur there, and uh, you'd never guess what they called it. They called it a Mutterborosaurus. Okay. <laughs> so that's where it comes logical. from. Logical? That's logical. But anyway, they call it a Mutterborosaurus, and this dinosaur is on display in the museum, which is uh, in the city near where I live. It's, a, it's actually uh, an enormous dinosaur. It's, it's, um, its head reach is pretty well as high as the ceiling, and uh, it's astounding when you walk into the museum and see it. So I have a picture which I took of this dinosaur, and I like to show to young people at school when I talk about them. Okay, Taz, I'm a teacher and I, I love talking about dinosaurs with my students. Clearly, they, they light up the moment that you, you start speaking about them. It's engaging and they're interesting. Um, what are some of the things that you, you talk about and the games that you play with kids? Well, one of the things that I talk about, they light up. I Absolutely. Once you start talking about them, the kids love them. And uh, so I ask them questions about what do you notice about this dinosaur. And so, of course, the kids are all full of wanting to say what they see. And so the hand goes up and uh, I and, uh, say something like, it's standing on its back, two legs. I say, yeah, I noticed that, but there's something else that I noticed. And they'll say, oh, it's got a long tail. And I say, yeah, I noticed that, but there's something else. And oh, it's got it's got little things sticking out of its its backbone. I say, yeah, there's something else I noticed though. And, and they go on and on and on. And eventually they run out of guesses, you know. And I say, well, I'll tell you what I noticed. The thing I noticed about it is that it's dead. And they just laugh and they realize, of course, it's dead, you know, because obviously dead. It's so obvious that nobody, it's, uh, nobody's mentioned it. Uh, and so that's a really significant thing because there's a sign uh, when you walk in which says, uh, Matabarasaurus roamed around uh, Queensland 100 million years ago. And so it's got this 100 million years. And so the, the, the thing is, that means, according to that sign, that death has been around for 100 million years. And uh, not only that, but uh, scientists have uh, examined the, the uh, backbones of dinosaurs like this, and they've discovered that they have tumours, and these tumours are the same as the tumours that uh, uh, appear in the backbones of humans, cancer tumours. So that means death, suffering, cancer has been around for 100 million years, according to that worldview. And uh, when we're talking about 100 million years, the thing is I, I often uh, put up a little picture for the, for the kids and uh, I say, look, I'm going to tell you a secret about a paleontologist and a, a paleontological secret. And uh, I say, when they discover a dinosaur bone, and I've got a picture of this guy in a big hole in the ground digging out this dinosaur bone, I says, it doesn't come up with a label attached to it, which is... I'm 100 million years old. All, it, all that they dig up is the bone. And so I just use that as a teaching point for the kids to teach them about science and about evidence and about speculation and that sort of thing because what the museums tell us is a lot of speculation. Mm. And like children, I'm sure adults as well, we're not going to think through the fact that because this dinosaur has this apparent label of an age, um, that that means death and even suffering with the tumours has been around for that long. Exactly right, because it's the museum 
The museum's a very prestigious organisation. It's on the sign there. Everybody just accepts it must be true. And so that's why I show the picture of them with the dinosaur bone digging out the hole and uh, in the ground. And, and so what happens is I say, well, the bone, that's the science. You can observe the bone. You dig it out the ground. You can weigh it. You can, you can put it in the machine and analyse the chemicals in it. That's the science. That's the evidence. And it doesn't matter who you are. You make the same observation. But then people say, well, this is 100 million years old. That's not, that's not uh, evidence. Nobody saw that. There was nobody with a camera 100 million years ago taking a photograph of it. That is just interpretation, speculation. It really comes out of a belief system. It comes out of people's heads. And so that's what I explain to the young people is there's a different way of looking at things. And uh, I try to show them how, how to look at things and make sure that they can see, hey, not everything that we're told is factual. And so the, I make the point about the 100 million years. You, you mentioned about, about death, suffering, and disease being around. And that's an evolutionary worldview. Is it death? the survival of the fittest. That's what brought about our existence is, is uh, people dying, animals dying. Uh, but, you know, the other worldview, which the, the Bible, the Word of God tells us that death is actually an interloper. It's something that was not intended from the beginning. And so I use that to explain about why it's so important uh, for the kids to understand it. So, Taz, do you think that as you explain this to children, or to kids, they make that connection between this apparent age of these dinosaur bones and evolution. Well, they have probably never realised it before that it's presented to them within within a belief system. They just think it's all fact. And so that's what I try to, sh to put it up. And so I say, well, look, this is how the Bible explains where everything came from. And I put up a picture of the creation during, you know, the Bible tech talks about when everything was created, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, different things. And, and I ask the, you know, the kids say, I say, so when did uh, kangaroos first appear on the earth? And someone will put up their hand and they'll say, day six. So, well, how do you know it's day six? The Bible doesn't mention kangaroos. And they'll say, ah, oh, it's, a, it's an, an a animal that lives on the land. I say, that's exactly right. All the land animals lived on day six. And then I might talk about the elephants, day six again. And so I say, when did the dinosaurs first appear on the earth? And somebody put up their hand and say, uh, on day six, for the same reason, that's right. And so I say, that's exactly right. See, the Bible tells us when different things happened. And it's, it's, like a, it's like a camera being there when it happened. And then I say something like, what else appeared on day six? Someone will say, people. I say, that's right. So that means that people... And dinosaurs lived at the same time. The reason why these young people are so sort of puzzled by it, by it's such a big brain stretch for them, is because they've only ever heard that dinosaurs died out millions of years before people appeared on the earth. And yet the Bible tells us that people and dinosaurs both appeared on the same day, that they uh, God created them on the same day. And it was a beautiful world. It was an amazing world. There was uh, no harm or hurt. And then I go into a little um, question for them. I, I, I put up a picture of T-Rex. And, and of course, what's this T-Rex? Kids know the names of the dinosaurs. They do, don't they? And then I put, them, put it up and I say, look at the teeth on this animal. Look at the teeth. They're 15 centimetres long and the row at the top, a row at the bottom. So with teeth like that, what would this dinosaur originally have been? And then I say, hands up, who thinks originally this would have been a plant eater? Next to nobody puts their hands up. And then somebody will, mm. and then all the other kids look, oh, 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 you know, crazy, you know, fancy thinking that. And then I say, who thinks that this would originally been a meat eater? And all the hands go up, they think it's a meat eater. And who thinks it would have been a scavenger? The hands go up, and who thinks it would have been a meat eater and a plant eater? And, and then I'll say, do you think that the Bible would tell us what dinosaurs ate originally? And... Uh, they think, no. I said, well, it does, actually. I said, if you look just after God finished creating 
at the right there in the beginning, God tells the God says what He's made for all the animals to eat. And he says all the birds, all the animals, all the animals that creep on the ground. I've given you every green herb for food. So what were they originally? They were plant eaters. So that enables me to just go into explaining. Uh, you know why? Why was that? Why did why didn't God sort of T Rex big animal? Why didn't he say um, if you're feeling hungry, have a chomp on Adam's leg? And they think that's pretty cool. But anyway, <laughs> and of course because there was nothing that caused any hurt or harm at the beginning, there was no bloodshed. Adam and Eve weren't scared they were going to get eaten by an animal, and uh, they weren't sort of worried that tigers were going to eat them all up. And so it was a good world. And so I, and then I show them, uh, explain to them, well, what happened? And then I put the um, picture up of Adam and Eve eating the fruit from the, from the Garden of Eden. So you're giving us this different view, this different worldview that perhaps they haven't even considered mm. um, because all they've been told is one particular worldview. And how do they um, receive this? How do they start to respond to this? Well, once they get over the initial surprise, the initial shock, they, they, they gradually start to get it, you know. And so we, I, I run through the whole world view about how God created the dinosaurs, created all the animals, and then why there's bad things in the world. And then I'll, I'll go through, put up a picture of, uh, talk about T-Rex's teeth again. I say, you know, well, what about these teeth? They're obviously designed for eating meat. And, I say, and our what? picture of T-Rex, all we've ever seen is this ferocious exactly you know, right. Jurassic Park kind of animal that could only surely attack. <laughs> That's right. And you see them running around, killing other animals and eating them all up and blood everywhere. And uh, so um, and, and so that's what they think, these big teeth. And I say, well, they're obviously sharp. And so then I, I put up a picture of an animal which has got these very sharp teeth. And uh, I'll say, uh, what do you think this is? Look at the teeth on this animal. It's a fruit bat. And so and it, I say, I'm not going to ask you what fruit bat eats. What, what does a fruit <laughs> bat eat? Just because an animal's got sharp teeth doesn't mean to say it was designed for eating meat. And I give them examples of lots of animals that have got sharp teeth that don't eat meat. There's a panda bear that eats vegetation. There's a monkey in South America that's got huge teeth that only eats fruit and, uh, and that... And so that just makes the point, you know, that you can misunderstand what we see in the world and interpret it the wrong way. And so I then go on and explain some more in the, in the, in the line of how it fits into the worldview. And I explain about the, the creation. I've talked about that. The flood, the fall, I talk about that. And then I bring up and talk to them about the huge catastrophe, the biggest disaster in world history. Okay. So how do you introduce that? What do you tell them happened? It's the flood, the global flood that the Bible describes. And that's crucial for understanding dinosaurs. How come? Well, why do we find dinosaur fossils all over the world, you see? And why do we find them buried in all this sediment that's been laid down by water? And, uh, and it's interesting that... When they go to a museum, often they'll have a picture of a dinosaur, you know, how do dinosaur fossils form? A very so, convincing picture. So explain to us what, what are they exactly drawing right. in here. And so they have a dinosaur uh, walking around and it dies. It might be in a river or something and it dies and it sort of gets, it, it, it gradually sinks to the bottom of a lake. Mm -hmm. And then eventually the, the sediment sort of falls on top of this dinosaur and over millions of years it gradually gets covered in sediment and then it fossilises. That's the story. Yeah. And, then, and so the whole way along that dinosaur has looked pretty much the same yeah, in those pictures. Yeah, that's right. Nothing's eaten it. Mm -hmm. Nothing scavenged it, according to that picture. And uh, then what happens is that the, the, the earth is uplifted and there's erosion and the dinosaur fossil is sort of uncovered. And so I, I'll say to the kids, you know, so what do you think about this picture? Is there anything wrong with this? Does anybody keep a fish? Anybody got an aquarium? Anybody had your fish die? What happens when your fish dies? It floats to the top, mm. doesn't sink to the bottom. So oh, there's a problem there. And, and so we talk, talk about that. And then I just mentioned about 
they love it if you talk a little bit, little bit gruesome and about the body and how to preserve the body and, and how if the body, when it sort of decays, it fills up with gas and the boys love it and the girls go, you know, that sort of thing. And then I said, it has to have a lot of sediment on it. Otherwise, it just floats up to the, floats out again and it gets eaten. So it has to be buried quickly. And, and that's why... If it's buried quickly, it can't be millions of years old. And yet I walk into many museums with this picture telling me that this is how a fossil forms. Yeah, that's right. And this intact dinosaur floating to the bottom, still being intact as it's slowly buried to teach me that that's how a fossil forms. How do they get away with doing that how if do it they doesn't get away? sound possible? People don't think about it. I, I was at a museum, big display of dinosaurs just recently in our museum. They're all from Patagonia in South America. And it's amazing. The biggest dinosaur in the world, they said it is, and it's enormous. Anyway, what happened was I, I'd stand there and I'd look at it and they'd say, maybe there'd be an attendant in there and I'd say, wow, this is an amazing display. It's incredibly big. Isn't that incredible? And they go, yeah, it's, they're very proud of their display. I say, how, how would it have been buried? How would this have been buried? It would have had to be buried quickly, wouldn't it? And you can see that they're puzzled. I had one uh, attendant once sort of, he couldn't answer it, and he sort of raced off to see his superior <laughs> to, to get the answer for how it could be buried so quickly, you know, and so... And so the evidence is there. The evidence is there that the, of a catastrophe and the, the people who believe in long periods of time, they've got the problem of trying to explain it, but they don't really talk about that. So that's the sort of thing that I mentioned to the kids and particularly it's connected in with, um, you know, the biblical worldview which explains, you know, God made the dinosaurs and he made people. So that means all people are related. That means that uh, as, you know, you and me, that, that God's got a plan for us. He, he made us for a purpose, you know. And so I talk about that. And all that comes out of a little discussion on dinosaurs, you see. I get a lot of questions from my students about dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And I often um, am grateful for uh, the teaching that you and Creation Ministries have provided. And those questions are often just around exactly this, the, yeah. the millions of years. And it's nice to see the lights go on if you start to present this idea that there, there could be a different worldview yeah, that could help right. us understand what's yeah. going on here. Well, with Noah's Ark, I just explained about the, the Ark, about how, how the dinosaurs went on. I said, Who, maybe does anybody think that that perhaps is why we don't see dinosaurs today, is that uh, Noah didn't take them on the Ark? And uh, I said, who thinks, that Dino who thinks that Noah would have taken dinosaurs on the ark? And most of the kids put their hand up. And I say, well, how would he have got them on? And I put up a picture of this huge dinosaur, Noah trying to push it through the door of the ark. And they, they'd laugh at it because, you know, the dinosaurs, some dinosaurs are enormous. And uh, then I say, so how do you reckon he would have got it on? It's Some a big boy. question for them. It's you know? a big question. And they've seen these pictures of bathtub-like boats yes. with a couple of animals and their heads sticking out. And so you automatically think about some of your bigger sauropods and go, well, they wouldn't fit. They wouldn't fit. That's right. And that's what the kids think. And so they got this picture of they're trying to fit this great big sauropod through the, the ark door. Mm. And uh, I, I asked them, how do you think Noah would have got them on? And there's always some, you know, budding young engineer. I trained as an engineer, but there's some budding engineer who um, says, well, he could have got a great big crane and he could lift it up and he could cut a hole in the roof. And, you know, and he's talking about putting this dinosaur in and, and there's usually some little girl at the front says, no, nah, he could have taken the babies on. And, of course, that would be how to do it, just take the young ones on because, you see, dinosaurs... Uh, hatch out of eggs and they find fossils of dinosaur eggs, actually uh, eggs where it's still got the embryos in them of dinosaurs. And so the dinosaurs hatch out of eggs. Even the largest dinosaur egg was only as large as a football. So even the largest dinosaur was once little. And lots of dinosaurs are little. So you have no trouble fitting them on. And so I explain that to the kids and it's all really, they, they really appreciate that and they really enter into it. I would find that even helpful as an adult to hear they didn't have to be really big and that not all dinosaurs, it's not like the majority of dinosaurs are that size. 
Yeah, that's right. A lot of them are little. A lot of some of the size of chickens, average size, about the size of say a sheep, something like that. Uh, but there are a few really big ones, you know. Do you see students as they start to hear some of this change their minds about um, the fact that dinosaurs might not have to be millions of years old? Yes, you do see them change their mind. Not uh, changing the mind is one thing, but you see them starting to understand the worldview. And once you understand the worldview, that that enables you to think differently. So you see the students starting to pick up the different way of thinking and they become very excited about it, which is really, really good. And because the, the, uh, the different way of thinking with Noah's Ark, that explains why you find dinosaur fossils all over the world. They're buried rapidly during Noah's flood. And uh, so I put up pictures of that. And, and how the does someone the- who says that it wasn't the flood, how do they try and explain these dinosaur fossils all over the world? That, well, again, according to that picture, where they die and they sink to the bottom and then they get covered. It's like when I went to this dinosaur display in Patag- uh, from Patagonia in the local museum, you know, they, they don't actually try to explain how they get buried. They explain that they were buried and they've got pictures of them digging them up, but they don't try to explain these inconsistencies. It seems to be something that just sort of gets swept under the carpet. Well, those pictures are probably powerful enough as well that it's like you focus on that. And you don't ask the question. Yeah, that's exa- that's exactly right. Because the pictures are very powerful. I, I was speaking to a lady once. They, they grew up in a church, a local church out in the country. And as she said, her brother was very, very keen. He became a Christian in his teens and he was very keen. He was always uh, at church. He was had a Bible open and you know, as a, as a teenager. But she said, I remember that he started asking questions and they, he couldn't get answers. And so he ended up, he, he, he abandoned being a Christian and he became an atheist and he became actually a geologist and uh, he, he he's basically um, hasn't been near a church for 40 years or more than that, 40 years. And whenever she, he wouldn't talk about it. And anyway, this it's a very interesting story is that she came across some back issues of Creation magazine and she thought, oh, Glenn will like these. So she bundled some up and sent them to him in the other side of the country. And she said, he ended up ringing her. I can't believe that a sister of mine would believe this nonsense. And he went on and on, you know, <laughs> the world's millions of years old. And, and he went on. He, he, she said he went, he, he sort of went into her situation for about an hour. And she said, I was so pleased because we haven't been able to talk about anything to do with the Bible for 40 years. And then uh, he rang up again after he hung up because there are other things he wanted to say. And then sometime later, she got a book in the post. It was a book about dinosaurs. My sister obviously doesn't understand about dinosaurs. And so he sent her a book about dinosaurs so she can understand that they're millions of years old uh, and that Noah's flood and and the Bible's not true. And so she came to to see us and wanted to find out about how to explain it to him. And she says, I've never been interested in dinosaurs. (laughs) You know, but it opened the door for but that it conversation. it opened the door and she said, if it's mm. going to help my brother, I'm going to learn about them, mm. which is really, really cool. Mm. Taz, I find that um, students will often get their knowledge of dinosaurs and what they think they know about them from movies like Jurassic Park and all of the movies that have come in that series. And they teach particular things and students don't realise often that they're just taking that on as fact. And so, for example, the last uh, Jurassic World movie focuses more in on dinosaurs having feathers and um, dinosaurs that perhaps don't seem to exist, um, but this is like a new type of dinosaur. And so my students are often surprised if I'm suggesting that maybe that information's not correct, even though they know it's a movie. They know it's a movie, yeah, but it, it comes across and they believe it. And then if you tell them it's not true, they, they don't like you. It's a shock to the system. It's a shock and to the team. Yeah. yeah, you've got to talk through, well, hang on, it's a movie here. Is there sometimes a bit of a, a bias behind those movies to, to teach some things that might not be true? Well, the movies are wanting to, they're wanting to get a big audience. And so they're, they're not particularly worried about being factual, you know. They do include facts and the latest information, but it doesn't necessarily all have to fit 
fit together. Yeah, we've really appreciated having some um, Creation Ministries books and magazines and things around for the students to be able to read. And it's amazing to see how quickly it promotes conversation and and the students saying, I've got a question about this because even just the pictures are powerful to see, mm. hang on, this is something here that I've not been taught most of my life. Or I've, I've seen the movies or I've heard the, the comments from you know, whoever it might be, that our world is millions of years old and dinosaurs mm. are a part of that. And they're taught from a very young age. Like, um, uh, it, it's not as if they wait till they're at high school that they're taught about this. And even in primary school, they're taught in preschool about it. I, I remember I was on a meeting um, at a little a little mining town out in, out, you know, in the outback of Queensland. And uh, I was just asking, I put up a picture of dinosaur and I said, anybody know the name of this dinosaur? And a little kid at the back, there's only about 30 people in the meeting. A little kid at the back put up his hand and he says, Triceratops. And uh, I said, yeah, that's right. That's really good, mate. And his parents were really proud of him, <laughs> you know. And then I said, so how long ago did this dinosaur live on the earth? And he put his hand up again. And he, I said, yeah. He said, a hundred million years ago. I said, wow, where did you learn that? And he says, at preschool. I said, how old are you? He held up his fingers. Four. He's four years of age. So- I'll go further than that, Taz. My children were learning at two, three years old, watching a very, you know, some of the basic play school. There's another one called Dino Dana. And it's it's a beautiful story, but it's it's teaching them from such a young age. Yeah. And so basically it's, it's within this worldview. It's a secular, a naturalistic worldview, which believes that everything made itself, that there was no intelligence behind it. So that's, that's what the worldview is. And, and it's, you know, it's wall to wall, you know, from beginning to end. That's all that's really taught. And it's, uh, that's why we're having this conversation so that we can uh, balance it up a little bit. I have to say, Taz, that it's been wonderful to see even my little ones when we, when we see these shows that are teaching them about dinosaurs being millions of years old. Um, when we teach them to think about the facts and the evidence and even that lovely picture that you described is saying, well, does the, does, does the dinosaur bone, when we dig it up, have a tag on it that says how old it is, how they can start to think through that and realise that doesn't have to be the case here. Mm. And um, to see my children as they've grown up be able to now, when they hear other people talking about the world being millions of years old and that dinosaur fossil being millions of years old, to be able to say, well, how do you know that? And I've, I've heard my, my uh, eight-year-old say, actually, there's a different story. <laughs> So lovely that we can start to help them understand that that doesn't have to be the story. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I, I, we got a, 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 a message from a young guy. He was, he was in his final year of high school and he just made this message. He says, I've been reading creation stuff for years. And he says, it's a lot of fun. So he's getting this information and reading about it. And he says, I'm actually finding that I'm acing my high school science class from what he learned through this creation material. And he says, we're actually learning about evolution and I seem to know more about it than my teachers, which is very interesting. So it's a very positive in the lives of young people when they get these concepts in their head and able to sort of distinguish between what is fact and what is just made up story uh, and then see how it connects with them uh, and their purpose in life and with the Bible, the Word of God, it makes a huge difference in their lives. I love that you say it like that. They start to learn to know what's fact, distinguish between what is fact, what's hard evidence, the scientific method, Mm. and what is a story Mm. and the difference between those. It's powerful to be able to know the distinction as a young person. Yeah, it's been great to talk about that and to be able to fit it into a different worldview. Excellent. Mm. Thanks so much, Taz, for spending the time with us talking about this today. 